Hello everyone and welcome to the latest episode of Sug Talks. I'm Craig Dell, your host, and together with our special guests, we'll take a deep dive into the topics, challenges and opportunities facing SAP users today. Please make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss another episode. I'm delighted to be joined today by Steve Clark, SAP Centre of Expertise Director at Walgreens Boots Alliance. And today's episode is the latest in our series of interviews with senior IT leaders to hear about their career highs and career lows and tips for getting ahead and the challenges they've faced throughout their career. So welcome, Steve. Thanks very much. Great. Good to be with you. Great. And it, it feels like there's been quite a few blockbusters being released at the cinemas at the moment. I mean, after a very quiet period we've had over the pandemic. So for our icebreaker question, I thought I'd ask you, what is your favourite movie? And to start, no. mine is one called Conspiracy Theory. And not many people I talk to have actually heard of this. It's a Mel Gibson and Julia Roberts film. Uh, it, I, I just find it excellent. It's all about, if you like, conspiracy theories and a conspiracy theorist. And, uh, yeah, I do really like it. And, Steve, what's yours? So my favourite movie, I think, would be Shawshank Redemption. So uh, the, the, it's, I mean, it's a bit of a, uh, it's a bit of a trope now, isn't it? And so many people say it's their favourite, but uh, the kind of triumph through adversity and that sort of thing of uh, of Andy Dufresne, I think, is uh, is a great story. Uh, but I'm also particularly looking forward to uh, to the new Top Gun film. Um, so. Uh, I had a bit of a spell in the Air Force on, on leaving school. So, um, so yeah, I've watched Top Gun, the original movie, many, many times in various uh, Air Force crew rooms around the world. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to the, to the new one, although convincing my teenage kids to come and see me with me is, uh, is, a, is a bit of a challenge at the moment. But, uh, <laughs> Might yes, be on so, your own on that one. But <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard so. some good reports or read them anyway about, about the Maverick movie. So, you know, hopefully, yeah, the... The original's a, a, a classic, a, as well as the, the Shawshank Redemption. I l love that movie. And I think it it may still be, I'm not sure, but uh, it was the highest-ranking movie on IMDb, I think, for the highest rating ever uh, for okay. Shawshank. But, so you're not alone in that one. So to get us started and, and over to our main topic of conversation, and I thought we'd maybe just go back to the beginning, if we, if we may, and okay. just ask, how did you get into IT? And then what led you to the field of SAP? Um, so, uh, well, as, as I said, I had a, uh, my first uh, uh, job out of school was, uh, was in the Air Force. Um, so I, w I spent nine years uh, in the Air Force as uh, they, they used to call, be called data analysts in those days. So it was my job to uh, do things like um, aircraft servicing lifing for, for various different types of, of aircraft. So um, I would be working through kind of early days of, of spreadsheets. So I think super calc and all that sort of stuff. I um, remember that. And, uh, and one of the things that I, that I did when I made a decision to uh, to leave the Air Force was um, was to do a bit of uh, a bit of kind of adult education. So uh, I, I did an HNC uh, in business studies. Um, and, and I'll admit to kind of not being the hardest worker when I was at school. So I soon figured out that I needed to do a bit of ad adult education if I was to, uh, to be successful in my, in my career outside of the Air Force. Um, so, yeah, started doing a, an HMC in business studies um, and uh, w with a view to trying to get a, a, an accounting job when I, when I left the Air Force. Um, so, so having done that, I uh, I took a job as uh, as a management accountant for a, a business in the uh, in the southeast called Bell and Hell. So they used to make mail processing machines and, and one or two other things. Um, and so I was a an, an analyst in the accounting department, uh, working for our, our service business at the time. Um, so uh, I spent the whole of my life in front of spreadsheets and and sort of uh, doing. Uh, financial forecasts and that sort of stuff 
Um, and it's, I soon realized that I was actually spending a lot of my time trying to uh, analyze a bunch of data and that sort of stuff that had been sent to me by the various different European businesses that we run. Um, and because I'm a bit of a sort of analytical thinker, um, I soon started thinking, well, I'm, I'm wasting a lot of time here um, figuring out the, the various different formats of these spreadsheets that have been sent by these different business units. Um, and started picking away at that a little bit and, and found out that we'd had a, an ERP system uh, implemented, which was producing these reports in various different formats. Um, and so continued picking away at that for a while and soon found out that basically this ERP tool had been implemented differently in, in all of our various different businesses. Uh, and, and that was creating a whole bunch of, of business problems in addition to, uh, to to the ones that it was causing me in terms of kind of consolidating the management reports for this uh, uh, for this business on a monthly basis. Um, so I, I decided to kind of come up with a bit of a plan to to go and ask the board for some money to, to fix a bunch of this sort of stuff. Um, so I, I put together a paper and, uh, and asked the board for £100,000 to, uh, to, to fix a bunch of these uh, problems that we're facing, which included some kind of business process re-engineering, some consolidation into some best practice uh, type of, uh, of kind of things for reporting and how we did invoicing and one or two other things. Um, and managed to convince the board that uh, that was a, a, a good way to spend some of the company's money uh, and then set about going to our uh, German, uh, French, Dutch and uh, 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 else was and Spain uh, to, to those businesses to basically do a bunch of, uh, of kind of re reconfiguration of this ERP tool and, a, and some kind of process redesign and implementation. So that was a, a process which took me a about six months kind of going to those various different businesses and, and, uh, and figuring that sort of stuff out. Uh, and when I came back to my management accounting job afterwards, uh, and by which time I'd kind of automated all the spreadsheets that I got and was able to do what was taking uh, every single month to, to figure out this consolidation and production of these management reports, I was doing that in the space of about three or four days a month. So it was kind of pretty bored and, uh, and, and, and think it, having done all this sort of IT related work, I had this vision of myself kind of sitting in front of these spreadsheets and numbers and stuff for the rest of my career and I thought, actually, I think I prefer doing what I've just done with the, with, with the sort of all the IT systems in the, in the business. And uh, so that's really what got me started. Um, so when I uh, when I decided then that I was going to make the move back up to to Nottinghamshire, I was living in the southeast at uh, at the time down in uh, down in Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire. Um, I I took a uh, I interviewed and got a job with a uh, a business that sold sort of um, uh, things like Sage and Pegasus and uh, and the sort of forerunner of uh, of Navision and, and so sort of I guess you'd call them tier two ERP systems um, and and that's basically what got me started on my uh, on my IT career uh, and and then it was a, a process of kind of uh, starting to figure out how to do system configuration how to kind of put together projects and uh, and implement successfully for customers uh, and and then from that point it was really a well okay so how do you kind of, what's the, the biggest and most challenging system to work with? Uh, and soon figured out that every time I looked at, uh, at SAP roles, there seemed to be quite a bit more on the salary for those positions than, than what I was getting at the time. Um, and uh, so having, having worked this business for probably, I think it was a two and a half years, um, I uh, applied for and was successful in getting a role at uh, Siemens Power Generation in, in Lincoln. Um, and they were just on the cusp of starting their first SAP implementation. And, uh, and so I joined that business as a bit of a poacher term gamekeeper, really. So uh, I applied for a, a general IT role in that, um, in that business, but with a view to having spoken to the IT director at the time about going on to the program leadership team for the SAP implementation uh, and working with the partner to scope the program successfully and uh, and make sure that we had a plan which held water uh, and uh, and so that was that was that then I've been kind of off and running in my SAP career sort of ever since um, and uh, through sort of various different consulting roles and uh, uh, and that sort of stuff is, is sort of how I've ended up in the position where I am now so um 
yeah, it's uh, it's been a sort of in interesting journey, but uh, but yeah, it's been a, a a very fulfilling one, and and one which has enabled me to work for obviously a, a well known brand like like Boots via kind of one or two others along the way, like Rolls Royce and, and Jaguar Land Rover, working for for partners uh, of them from an IT point of view. Um, so yeah, I've been uh, incredibly lucky, but but also uh, incredibly privileged to work for some of the businesses that I've worked for, and and it's also pretty rewarding to work for a, a, a company based in my in my home city of Nottingham. So yeah, mm. that's that's a, a bit of a bit of my story, I guess. No, oh, thanks very much. What what I really like about that story, Steve, is it is right back at the beginning, if you like, when. You, you saw a problem or you felt challenged in, in what you were receiving. You thought there was a better way of doing things. And, and perhaps at that point, it's almost like stepping outside of your remit, putting your head above that parapet to say, you know what, I've looked at this. I think we can do better. I think this can be improved. You know, 100k was probably a decent, a sizable amount of money uh, to to go and ask for, and that drove you into something that that you've you've really loved doing ever since. Yeah, yeah, and and, and as I said, you know, I'm a bit of a sort of analyst thinker. So um, as I've sort of taken on more senior positions and uh, and recently completed an MBA, you know, I've done quite a bit of. Um, sort of personal assessment of the way that I approach leadership and thinking and that kind of thing and, and you do all the Belvin, Belvin assessments and those sorts of things um, and and I do like to think of myself as a as a bit of a problem solver as well as a, a leader so I'm always a, a driver of uh, improvement initiatives uh, as well as doing the sort of day job of delivering programs and running production systems and that kind of thing so I, I've always had a bit of a uh, transformation and improvement sort of uh, desire in my in my uh, in, in the way that I approach my, my role so um, in the way that we put the uh, the SAP Centre of Expertise team together at, uh, at, at Boots and now at, uh, at Walgreens Boots Alliance we've we've always had an improvement agenda as part of that organisation so you know how can we get better at programme delivery how can we improve the uptime of our production systems yeah, how can we become more efficient in the way that we do our work? Um, and I've been incredibly well supported by a team who are equally enthused by uh, by improving the way that we do our work as well as the mm -hmm. uh, the actual delivery of the work itself. So um, so yeah, it's always been kind of an important aspect of uh, of kind of having a fulfilling role, I guess. Yeah, very much so. That's it. So how you obviously went through that process and, and different, you, you mentioned their partners or the customers, and how did you land your roots, uh, land your role at Boots? Um, so I, uh, well, it's, it's a bit of a story to that. So uh, having uh, had a number of consulting roles in, in the past, um, I was doing quite a lot of traveling at the time. So, um, so I was, you know, away from home a lot, the usual kind of, uh, Monday to Friday hotels and, and that sort of thing um, and so I've always had a bit of an eye on who the large SAP users were around uh, around Nottingham because I thought if there's ever a, a role that comes up at one of those then I sort of made a, a promise to my wife that I'd throw my hat into the ring for a, a role there so that I could cut down on the, the travel and, and spend more time at home and particularly as my uh, as my kids were still kind of young at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so yeah, position came up at Boots as the uh, SAP Centre of Expertise lead, uh, and so uh, I put in my application for that role um, and uh, was successful in that interview process, uh, which was pretty lengthy uh, and and challenging. And actually, the, the the guy who interviewed me, who who was the IT director at the time, a chap called Erwin van Groenhoven had been the uh, the lead on a couple of the SAP programs at, at Boots and so was pretty SAP savvy. And so the first time in my career, I was being kind of interviewed for, for a role where I was supposed to be a subject matter uh, expertise sort of uh, person, so the, the lead of this SAP organisation. And I soon figured out that the guy who was interviewing me knew quite a lot more about the detail of SAP than I did. So uh, there's always a pretty challenging, uh, a pretty challenging interview process, but... Um, but yeah, fortunately, I, I got through that okay. And the irony of it is that uh, I'd no sooner joined than, um, than not quite day one on the job, but within the first uh, couple of months, 
uh, my boss at the time said, Jim, yeah, we're, we're just starting this, uh, this SAP program at, uh, at Walgreens at Chicago in the US. And, um, and we're looking for somebody to help us to, to construct that program and, and get it off the ground successfully. And, and how would you feel about doing some travel to Chicago? <laughs> uh, so ha- having made this promise to my wife about kind of being done with traveling, it's sort of, uh, I, I was then in Chicago every other week setting up this, this program with our, our colleagues in the US. Um, and, and still to this day, I have more United Air Miles than I could possibly ever know what to do with. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, which is a, a kind of pleasant side effect. But, but nevertheless, you know, once you've, you've, you're flying to and fro uh, from America, every other week sometimes the last thing you want to do is to get back on a plane uh, yeah. so it so it's only now some uh sort of probably four or five years later that i'm actually getting around to using some of those air miles um so so yes it, uh, but you know boots is a, a a great company to work for um they're, they're incredibly supportive um as a as an employer um, i've been very very fortunate that they sponsored me to do an mba um, that we've been able to that we've been able to kind of grow the SAP Centre for Expertise organisation from uh, just being a sort of project orientated setup to be really a sort of full suite uh, SAP organisation. So from production support all the way up through architecture and uh, and definition of uh, a, a kind of you know uh, sort of projects and programmes to, to to transform some of the, the ways that we do our business. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I can't speak too highly of Boots as, a, as an employer. They're, they're incredibly um, you know, a great company to work for with a, a fantastic heritage and brand name. And uh, and it's certainly, you know, a source of some personal pride that they're a, a major employer in Nottingham, um, the, the city where I've kind of lived for the last 35 years or so uh, on and off. And um, so, yeah, it's uh, I, I've been very lucky and feel very privileged to hold the position that I do. Oh, fantastic, and you know one one of the things that often comes up in in these discussions around successful projects and successful implementations and whatever you're looking to do is that executive sponsorship ownership buy in, and it sounds like you know you, you you've really got that there at Boots, so that that that's great to hear. Hi, we're the UK and Ireland SAP User Group. Did you know we're a fiercely independent, not for profit? Did you know we're a vibrant community of over 6,500 SAP users? And did you know we help each other by sharing resources, championing education and influencing SAP's future development? Well, you do now. If you'd like to get the most from your SAP investments and be in the know, visit our website, sapusers.org forward slash pod. We hope you enjoy the rest of the podcast. And just how how big is your your, your team in uh, Boots? Uh, so we have uh, approximately 50 now in our SAP Centre of Expertise team. So uh, we that changed a little, uh, where are we now, two to three years ago when we created our uh, managed service arrangement with, with TCS. So we, we were previously, we had a, uh, Boots have done sort of various uh, outsource, insource and then uh, managed service type setups in the past um, so so we we used to have also a, a team who were running our, our production systems in conjunction with with cognizant as a partner uh, but uh, but on kind of uh, agreement with tcs that we'd have a managed service from them we we our team size changed from 65 so to to, to more like 50 um, but that team covers you know we've got project managers we've got kind of basis guys functional people architects um, across the sort of various different uh, solutions that we run, um, so 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 whilst you know if we get into a large transformation program, we typically need partner support to deliver that kind of work for our sort of day to day project and program delivery and leadership of our sort of production systems. Then we are we are pretty self sufficient uh, in in how we uh, and how we execute some of those pieces of work, and uh, and and it's actually been you know we've been very fortunate in our ability to attract a, a good cross section of people who are you know experienced and also some younger and developing people and uh, and also you know diversity equity and inclusion is uh, is something that's important to boot so it's a pretty uh, 
broad team with a, a good cross section of people who've been able to uh, you know enable us to be a, a successful organization in how we run and manage and deliver our SAP systems so yeah it's uh, it, it's it's a great place to work and uh, and yeah we've been very fortunate in the way that we've been able to build our team um, so when we when we um, started with that that program at Walgreens we also then built an extension to that SAP Centre of Expertise team in our uh, business in Chicago at Walgreens and that then was the, the, the starting point of us constructing a global uh, SAP Centre of Expertise organisation. So we now uh, have an organisational design which is resident within what we call a business services platform um, which has scope beyond SAP but also kind of looks after all of our uh, SAP related solutions and um, so we have a, a sort of global organizational design which uh, has it's a bit less kind of capability on, on the US side because there's a, a, a bit more of the TCS related folks uh, over in uh, over at Walgreens but um, but yeah it's uh, you know the success of the organization in the UK was really what enabled us to demonstrate that a similar organizational design in the US in our Chicago business connected into kind of what we have in, in our UK capability was going to be kind of more than the sum of its parts. So yeah, we now operate that as a, as a kind of global function, which is uh, you know a, a credit to all of the guys who work in the UK team and, and also you know, our colleagues in the US as well. Oh, excellent. And you know, we, obviously Boots is, is, is one of the biggest UK retailers and obviously you've mentioned their Walgreens, which is huge. Uh, kind of a, a American presence on, on, on that side of the pond, if you like, and, and your journeys to and fro to Chicago on that project. Now, obviously, the, the size and the scope is, is quite significant. And does that bring any particular challenges or, or requirements for your use of SAP? Yeah, I mean, it, it, we've got a bit of a sort of mixed SAP estate, really. So, um, so, so the S4 system that we run at Walgreens is really, uh, you know, well, at the time when we started that journey was pretty kind of bleeding edge uh, SAP uh, implementation. So uh, HANA large instances, uh, S4 latest versions, uh, and at a scale beyond anything which we, we had in the UK. So to give you some some sense of that. So Walgreens operates about 10,000 stores in, in the US. Uh, Boots is more like circa 2,300. Um, and and that, that implement, implementation in the US, uh, certainly in the, the, the work that we've done with SAP, SAP tell us that it's the, the largest SAP retail system uh, on Azure globally. Um, so you can, you know, you, so you only have to think about things like the volume of data coming in from EPOS through CAR, uh, the size of those HANA uh, systems, the, 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 the size of the infrastructure that it runs on, the volume of traffic that's passing backwards and forwards, the amount of weeding and feeding that that's, uh, the, a system of that size requires, the volume of data uh, passing around that, uh, that system, and, uh, and the fact that it's kind of resident within you know, a, a fairly complicated IT landscape with a number of heritage systems, you know, all the usual challenges around master data, um, around, uh, you know, keeping kind of those systems current, patched, um, upgraded, all of those kind of things are, are significant when you're operating at that kind of scale. And um, so, you know, when we constructed that program, we were very conscious to have kind of all the relevant partners. So at the time it was SAP, Accenture and uh, and ourselves as, as Walgreens Boots Alliance with some pretty senior people involved in that programme because uh, um, you know we couldn't afford for, for, for anything to go awry when you're operating at that kind of scale. So it was a, a significant investment in uh, in time and, and dollars but uh, but you know it was a, a key kind of transformation program for, for the Walgreens business because previously it is, it, you know, we had things like uh, an old AS400 in each one of our stores in the US. So just think about the complexity there and how much consolidation and effort is required to, uh, to, to run that type of estate. But when you're then running that in a live 
uh, you know, HANA-based SAP production system where all of the transactions are happening real time, then the, yeah, the volume of data, the, the amount of complexity, um, the reliance upon the kind of integration between the components and uh, and doing that on some some bleeding edge kind of SAP technology has has oftentimes been quite fraught. Um, and and so yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yes, quite a lot of complexity in there, and, and quite a lot of uh, transaction volumes, management of data. You know, and then for a, a large business like that, you know, making sure that those systems are are, are always up and available uh, with relatively small maintenance windows has been you know, significantly challenging. Um, so coming over onto the boots side. Um, uh, Boots runs uh, an SAP estate, which is uh, somewhat aged in some areas, um, but we have a, a, a transformation plan to, to, to drive that towards S4. Um, uh, but it's uh, so we've had a couple of previous SAP programs at Boots, um, which have never quite got to the finish line as a result of kind of shifting business priorities uh, it, it, so across the, the, the life of those programs. And so, you know, we are just in the process of tidying up a couple of old R3 systems um, and, uh, and, and moving those into, uh, into a, a new implementation of, of CAR in Azure, for example, to, to support PMR and our promotions, um, right up to, uh, you know, our latest kind of uh, system, which is well, besides that, uh, that, that CAR, our PMR CAR solution on Azure, uh, we still run uh, ECC, uh, we run uh, CRM for our Advantage card, so uh, the, the Advantage card that, that uh, about 50% of the UK population has a, has a Boots Advantage card that runs on a, uh, an SAP CRM system. Um, and, uh, and we've been through the, the, a sort of bit of a journey at Boots where it was a relatively unstable SAP landscape when, uh, when, I, when I first arrived and through some very diligent work by our our service team with uh, in conjunction with uh, Cognizant at the start and now at TCS as our partners, we've been able to greatly stabilise that landscape um, and enable us to uh, put us onto a much firmer footing before we start our, our journey to S4, which is slated to start kind of later on uh, later on this year. So uh, yeah, different challenges in, in different parts of our organisation and some very different uh, SAP solutions in, in use. But um, but I'm firmly of the view that you know um, we need a, a run focus first in in the way that we we run our SAP solutions, and that then gives you the, the credibility to to do some more of the kind of transformational types of programs that uh, that, that are possible with some of SAP's newer technology. Excellent. And so with with S four the the S four project on the horizon, if you if you like, is is that kind of your main? future plan at the moment for, for developing the, the, the move to S4? Is that, that the key project ahead? It is, yes. Certainly in our, in our boots business uh, and, uh, and also we have a, a couple of other uh, implementations. So, so our boots uh, ECC landscape, we run three ECC systems, uh, largely as a result of the sort of a bit of merger and acquisition acti activity. So we run a, a separate implementation for our opticians business, for the, for the main boots business and also for uh, the, our number seven beauty company, so that we have a CPG business within the group that uh, that runs a, a separate SAP system, um, and we expect to uh, approach that work as a bit of a, a you know do a, a greenfield design for the two B organisation. So uh, you'll you'll see in the press that uh, that we're it, there's a bit of a review going on with with Boots, and we're likely to be sold to uh, a new parent. Um, and so, so what we expect to do then is to design a, a, a fresh set of SAP systems for that 2B Boots organisation and then migrate our existing uh, systems into that new landscape. Um, so yes, that, that certainly I can see that being a, a significant programme likely across something like 24 months um, to, to get us to you know, an S4 uh, HANA based solution for that uh, for that 2B organization so um, yes that's certainly going to keep us all busy for a good, a good time to come yeah and, and just just reflecting back on that and, and what you were talking about earlier around skills and and the, and the team uh, I, I really like that aspect you were talking about about bringing the, the a young 
team through, you know, perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, I may be wrong, but university bringing in graduates, etc., in, into the team to develop them forward. And I think you said that you, you've got the skills, a great set of skills in the team to, to take everything forward. And with that S4 project on the landscape, it, 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 are you confident you, you've got the right team in, in place to take you forward? Is what we have seen, and you know, we, we, we did a paper on is obviously there is kind of a a skills gap somewhere out there where, you know, some customers are struggling to get the right people in their team to take the business forward, especially looking to the amount of SAP customers that are going to be moving to S4. Yeah, I mean, we, we typically, uh, for, for that size of program, I, I would expect that uh, we'll need some partner support for, for, that, for that type of program. But we're also very conscious about skills and capability planning within the team. So uh, so we, we typically run a, uh, a kind of monthly demand management forecasting type process of, of what we see on the horizon. Um, and on the back of that, we'll, we'll run a skills and capability plan where we take conscious decisions about, you know, what, what capability do we want within the team versus what might be something that we'd get from a partner. Um, and where something is what we consider to be core capability, then we'll kind of, you know, invest our, our training money in developing that, uh, that capability for ourselves. So, you know, we make great use of, uh, of, of the offer that you guys publish every year for Learning Hub. Um, and uh, and you know, uh, uh, lots of, of guys on the team have spent a good deal of time in that uh, learning hub developing new skills. Um, so, f so for instance, in our, our PMR program, um, you know, uh, we've developed a great team for, to to support that promotions project, um, made up of uh, folks who who have been in the organisation for quite some time. So, some of the younger uh, team members who've developed. Uh, their their car and PMR skills uh, alongside the program, um, and so I'd expect for that type of transformation project, we we you know we take a similar approach. So uh, in the early days, we would be looking to some partner support to help us with implementing the software, but then we'd also be running a, a conscious capability development plan to make sure that you know at the point at which the the partner leaves us, we've got a competent set of uh, of guys in the permanent team who are then able to take over that um, that landscape and deliver kind of additional capability. Uh, once they uh, once the partner goes away, because we you know we 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 like to be self sufficient and have a you know intellectual property within the team uh, to enable us to continue to transform and deliver programs into that uh, that new technology. Oh, excellent, yeah, good good plans and a, a really good strategy. Like you say, it, it's that element. It it's not being too reliant. On, on the partner, if you like, so that you know you you've got that skill set in your team to be able to take it forward and, and not fully rely on them. That, that great great strategy. And just just going back to you know you were talking about some some of the challenges earlier, and you know perhaps uh, I think fraught times were mentioned and unstable landscape etc. When when you first joined, so where where did you go for help? Where do you go for help when when you've got challenges like that? Um, I, I mean, we're, we're in the in the past we've been very uh, supportive of running uh, special interest groups and, uh, and that type of thing, and connecting with peers. Uh, I'm I'm always firmly of the view that there's you know there are there's very few new problems in the world anymore with the you know the the amount of uh, of information that's available to us via you know forums and uh, and other customers and and we've done special interest groups at, at boots in the past to to connect with other retailers and and typically come along to the annual user group events and that kind of thing so um so we have kind of used um sort of some partner support in 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 uh, in some specific areas um but largely we do it through peer group networking uh, and and that sort of skills and capability development uh, process that, that I previously talked about, um, but yes, it's uh, and I'm not just saying this because uh, you know on the, the the user group uh, podcast, but you know that, that those connections that we make via via the user group with with peers are are incredibly valuable uh, and enable us to you know be as self sufficient as we want to be in the areas where we've decided that it's core capability for us. Um, and, and whilst there are always some uh, some niche problems 
like particularly around you know where you might be running a heritage SAP system on some uh, you know an operating system, a database, and infrastructure that is very difficult to uh, to, to kind of retain capability in. Um, more often than not, there are, uh, as I said previously, that there, there are people who have faced challenges uh, that are similar, if not the same, and uh, and so you know connecting, keeping. Uh, ongoing connections with those peers is uh, is important to us and is a great quid, quid pro quo um, for, uh, for 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 sharing of information and uh, and enabling us to kind of both support other uh, other end users as well as ourselves. Yeah, thank you, and well, I'm I'm pleased that the UK community does play a part in that, and, and uh, you know we're here to support that. That 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 is great news. Thank you, and just. Kind of looking at, and I'm, I'm hoping maybe I can stop asking this question soon. But we're still coming out of it, so to speak. But you know, what challenges did the pandemic pose to you in in your job, and you know, how did you come overcome them? Um, I, I guess the the one area where we were really worried uh, was, you know, if you think about the, I mean. We we're relatively fortunate in that, you know, we've uh, we have a team who, you know, some guys are were previously coming in kind of an hour and a half tr commute time uh, on a on a daily basis. So occasionally, you know, we had people who were previously working from home. Uh, so we had a bit of that in the culture previously, but obviously, you know, the the, out the outbreak of the the pandemic kind of forced that issue for us. So just like every other company, we quickly reverted to Teams and, uh, and enabling uh, as much work from home as we could. But the one area where we were concerned was really, if you think about the initial stages of, uh, of a project when, you know, you're into uh, blueprinting and whiteboarding and all that sort of stuff, that, that was the one area where we were a bit concerned about whether we would be able to kind of crack that nut via, uh, via the use of, uh, of Teams and remote working technology. Um, but but actually our experience has been that uh, it's actually easier when everybody's remote. So if you can kind of think way back to sort of pre-pandemic when you might have been running a workshop where there were some people in the room, there were some people on a phone, there were some people uh, connected in via uh, via Teams or similar. You know you'd be talking to a a kickoff workshop in a room and then forgetting there were people on the phone and all that sort of stuff. When it's forced upon you and everybody is, re is remote um, then it actually makes you a bit more disciplined about how you use some of that some of those tools uh, and uh, and if you're conscious about kind of you know making sure that everybody has their say and and, and that you use the technology to to enable you to carry on doing things like whiteboarding and uh, and, and process design um, actually what we found is that it it was better for us to do some of those things via via some of that technology um and you know i'm a i'm i'm because as i said i'm a bit of an analyst thinker i'm a great lover of um of driving improvement through metrics so i can see through all of our project data all of our kind of production instant data and that kind of thing that we've seen no drop off in our service and in fact we now think that we are kind of more productive uh, enabling remote working than we were when we were asking people to uh, to come into the office all the time. So, just like with many other companies, we're now sort of um, trying to come up with a, a model that enables us to continue with uh, with with that approach whilst keeping people connected together. Um, so it, it is it is somewhat easy to lose some of those personal connections if you don't see people face to face. Uh, and and just recently we had. A great workshop at a at, at a facility that we have uh, in Nottingham, and got the whole team together, uh, and that just reminded everybody what a what a, a great um, you know what a what a great privilege it is to be able to kind of reconnect with people face to face again and, and that kind of thing. So uh, I, I think we'll end up with a blend going forwards, but it's uh, it's going to be a bit of a challenge without sort of mandating you know which days to be in the office to get the right balance between continuing to enable the additional productivity that we've seen via uh via the, the working from home and use of teams and that kind of thing with maintaining a, a a way of keeping everybody connected together so i expect over time that we'll come up with a you know whether it's a a, a sort of a wednesday or a tuesday wednesday in the office or something like that but um 
yeah, we'll, we'll 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 find a way through it, just like just like everybody else, I'm sure. But um, yeah, we've, we've certainly you know through all of our colleague surveys and that sort of stuff, found that um, it's a there's a range of people who you know, some love working from home, some not so much, and so it's it's finding the right blend. I think that's going to be critical for us going forwards. Uh, thank you, excellent. And you know, the, it, it it's certainly brought a, a, a new way of working, and, and seems to have brought out some real positive aspects for you. And yeah, you know, it, it it it's really pleasing in that way. That you know, sometimes you know, triumph can come out of adversity, uh, as you say. And just looking at you know, we talked about lots of different things and lots of different projects and successful projects and stakeholder buy-in, executive sponsorship, those things have come up in a lot of things that you've covered today. And just, I, I wondered if you had a, a, a couple of items that, you know, perhaps organisations should avoid doing when it comes to SAP projects. Um, yeah, so, well, I, I'm a big believer in, uh, in actually, it's the things that go wrong that, that give you the best learnings. Uh, sure. And yeah, uh, so, you know, I, I think the, the, the programs that I've had, which have been the most challenging, uh, have typically been around uh, stakeholder management. So getting the organizational change part of your program uh, designed well up front and getting the right stakeholders on board. Uh, it is always something to be extremely mindful of when uh, when constructing a successful program, uh, and you know better to pause at the start and take a bit of pressure on your timeline and get that done correctly, rather than kind of continue ahead with uh, with a set of stakeholders who, who who don't believe that you're doing the right thing or that the scope isn't quite uh, correct. Um, so so I think you know getting an organisational change plan which supports your program and is connected to a broader trend business transformation piece of work is, is critical uh, if, if that's what you're driving uh, for your program uh, and uh, and just like any large program of work uh, you know making sure that you understand the data uh, and the, the volumes that you're dealing with the transformation of that data and what your business requires in future in terms of um, uh, you know, the sort of uh, data output from the, the systems that you're using uh, is uh, is the other thing which in the past has uh, has bitten me occasionally. So uh, so organisational change and data are always the things that I'm very conscious of. Uh, on the whole, you know the the technology works. Uh, so it's about the other things which aren't as easy to control, which are, are typically the things which which need the most focus. Um, so yes, organisational change and data are always the parts of the program where I'm the most probing in terms of kind of making sure that we've got them set up right, that we've got the right sponsorship and that we've got the right understanding uh, of uh, of the requirements at the outset. Um, because yes, I've uh, I've got quite a few scars on my back from previous <laughs> previous previous programs where they haven't gone as well as I would have wanted. So um, so yeah, change in data definitely are at, uh, always at the forefront of my mind when we when we're setting something up at the start. Well, thank you very much for that. And and now I'd, I'd just like to you know have you look into your crystal ball if you like, and uh, you know what what do you think will be the biggest change we'll see in IT in the the next five years or so? I think I can see a couple of things on the horizon. So one is if you if you think about the traditional setup of you know an IT function and a business organization uh, and having them as separate um, separate parts of a, of, a, uh, of a company I think going forward to enable this kind of di digital transformation that we we are kind of heading for then I can see a much more integrated organizational design between IT organizations and uh, and their business customers so I, I certainly see a future where there's not those traditional boundaries between business and IT organizations where there's a much more embedded organizational design based on a kind of business process type setup or a value chain uh, type organization where there is no longer the the, uh, the traditional break of sort of business and IT colleagues, but there's really a more of a sort of cross-functional team that, uh, that understands the whole of the value chain and how it's enabled by IT solutions. Um, so that's going to take quite a lot of thought and consideration and setup and budgets and, and all those kind of things to to get right so I, I can certainly see that as a as something that we need to think about as uh, as it leaders going forwards 
and and then there's the whole piece about you know artificial intelligence automation some of those kind of things which if you look across the entirety of the the IT landscape today there's an absolute vast array of uh, of products and vendors and uh, and those kind of things where you know every application vendor tells you that you've got to talk to them about the capabilities within their application rather than choosing a piece of technology which works across multiple uh, IT applications in your in your landscape so uh, so, so getting those things um, correct as well is is going to be a significant enabler of you know not just uh, capability in SAP, but more broadly across the whole of your, your entire landscape uh, and choosing the right products which enable those things to be done on an effective uh, and efficient way across multiple IT applications is going to be quite a significant challenge, particularly given the, the volume of data that uh, the organisations like Boots have now uh, and and making sense of that, of that huge volume of data and enabling automation and, and transformation and uh, and artificial intelligence is uh, is going to be critical for uh, for us for, to enable you know the businesses of the future and uh, and the kind of digital uh, business which we're all now heading towards thank you and steve thank you very much Th thank you for your time thank you for your insights and it, it, it's been a, a great conversation so i'd really like to thank you for for being on our podcast and, and chatting through uh your, your career highlights with us I really do appreciate and sharing those thoughts and insights and thank you for listening uh we hope you enjoyed the conversation and found it valuable so if you did please make sure you subscribe and then you won't miss any of our future senior it leader interviews and until the next time stay safe stay well and keep washing your hands